just got a notification that you were live. <laughs> hey, awesome. we're live. We're live. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, thank you for tuning into the Inbrit Profiles broadcast. Uh, my buddy Chris, hey, is uh, shooting it because my wife uh, didn't make it in time. She's uh, she'll here yet. She'll be here. She lost her keys. So, um, yeah. He's going to help me because I can't think too many things at one time. So he's going to help me remember questions that you guys have sent in and ask me questions and just kind of shoot the crap about what I do because that's why we're here because a lot of people have questions. So I'm going to sit. Mm. sit. He's going to sit and uh, we're going to talk and pick and talk about Kemper stuff. So ask me a question. Um, okay, we have somebody from Brazil. Really? He said hi. Hi. Hello, Brazil. Brazil, really? I have yeah, people Brazil. all over the world that know my name, which is kind of bizarre. I know. So we're at our uh, band cave. We, Lone Star has a band cave, and it's uh, kind of cluttered from time to time because we store stuff here. We also rehearse here. Also do some profiling here. We do writing. We do uh, pre-production. We've done acoustic shows here, so we've done all this stuff. And I've got my wall of amps set up so I can... Uh, I was doing a bunch of IRs uh, a few weeks ago, so I set them all up in line so it would be easier to move mics back and forth. So. Um, what I do. He's also been known to create a cocktail or two here. We call it, yeah, Chris and I get together for, what do we call them? Kemper and Cocktails. Kemper and evenings. Cocktails. Yep, so. Kemper and Cocktails. Yes. And it says mix of 57 ribbon mic. Okay. Okay, hold on, Jamie. We'll get to your question in a second. I did have a lot of questions about the uh, microphones, like what I use to microphone and how, how, I, how I mic a cabinet. Um, and I will tell you that it's like it's the joke about how many guitar players it take to screw in a light bulb, you know, 10, one to screw in a light bulb and ten, nine to say they could have done it better. <laughs> so, or differently, the way I like to do it and the way I like to think of it is a speaker is a circle. I don't want to be too close to the edge of the circle and I don't want to be right over the voice coil. So I try to get just outside of the voice coil and to me the key is trying to keep from having phasing because when you have phasing you lose frequency. So. I try to position the mics as close together as, as I can, but also, if you picture the speaker as a circle, the speaker's gonna radiate out from the middle. Um, so you want to be equidistant from the center of the cone, or I want to be equidistant from the center of the cone. So even if they're further away, I wanna make sure they're, if I was drawing a line from the very center of the voice coil out, I want them to be the same distance. And another thing to keep in mind is, just because these microphones have a, a front or an end, that doesn't mean that's where the element is. So you kind of have to know, okay, I know I want 57 the elements in this area, and I want to line it up with the Royer whose element's right smack in the middle. So I'll try to get them close so that both elements are at the same plane so there's a little less uh, um, phase cancellation because you don't want to lose frequencies. Now. That is all to say, that's my starting point. And then, I just know if I'm too close to the center of the voice call, it's gonna be really harsh in the 2K area, so I'll move a little further away, and you'll start losing mid-range, you'll start, or not losing mid-range, but it does get a little more scooped in the mids as you move towards the edge. Now, for a lot of the metal stuff that I don't, I'm not as familiar with, a lot of people do mic it more towards the edge, because it does, you still get the thump with low end, but you don't have all the, the mid-range throaty stuff. Um, but it's all taste because everybody has something different they want to hear in their head. And what I do isn't going to work for everybody. And what somebody else does isn't going to work for everybody. There's no one size fits all. It's just a matter of find what works for you. And I've just, I've come to this over years of um, just trial and error, you know, recording in the studio, watching engineers do it. And most of my experience has been on stage. So we have a question. Most common adjusted parameters to get profiles gig ready. Definition, SAG clarity. Yeah, definitely that. So this is where I start with on mics and then literally little bits move. You know, an inch makes a huge difference. So you just keep moving them and keep profiling. And I would suggest starting with just a 57, know what that sounds like. Profile with just the ribbon mic, know what that sounds like. And then that way you know how you're going to blend them on a submixer. Now, what was your question? So the question was about making them gig ready. So with the definition, the clarity, the sag. Yeah, the um, I tend not to use the sag as much, but um, to me the most powerful parameter in this whole unit is in the amplifier section, and it is the definition. Um, the first thing I'll always grab is the definition. If it's too bright or too dark, I'll go there before I'll start tweaking EQ. 
uh, it seems to be more powerful, and it's something that you can't get in the real world. I mean, I sometimes wish all these guys had a definition control that I could just sweep and get slows to the focus oh, highs. Now they got me. Sorry. <laughs> Let me flip that. <laughs> There was another question there. I didn't want to let that go. Right. Someone was asking about, um, do you tweak the parameters differently for live or for studio? Yes. Um, but the definition is, if, and it's also true for single coils to humbuckers. Uh, the definition when I'm using the hum, humbucker will usually be set between six and seven. And if it's a single coil, it can go, you know, between four and five. And my P9 is usually between five and six. So okay. it really helps you kind of dial in for the pickups. Then you can always EQ. And I try to keep my EQs flat when I sell the profile so that you have the most amount of, of adjustment. Sure. And if it's not, if it doesn't sound good flat, I'll just keep reprofiling it, moving mics till it sounds pretty good flat. So you're doing most of your adjustments with the mics to end up with a flat EQ as opposed to re EQing from Yeah, the because paper. I mean, there's you can always take any profile and just EQ it to, to make it fit for you. I just, in trying to get something that will p appeal to the most people but still sound good to me flat, I'll just try to make it sound good to me flat or sound good to me with all the controls flat. That way it's just, yeah. I feel like. I'm a less is more guy. I don't run a lot of effects. I don't run a lot of anything. That's why I like the Kemper because a lot of these digital units will sound great once you get all the compressor and the delays and all that stuff on it. It sounds really cool, but for true amp sounds, to me, this just has the best true amp sound. And so I like it as dry as I can, unless I'm just really going for an over effect tone. AC Roberts likes the Pryat. Me too. I have one. And he also asks, what's in the cab? That is a Classic Lead 80, and it's a 112 cabinet from Third Power. These uh, little triangle things here, they actually cover up. There's actually baffle boards in there. So the speaker sits in a little triangular chamber, which cuts down on standing waves. So it's a really, I call it flat sounding, even though it's not flat, but it's a, there's no resonant frequency of the cab like you get with a lot of 112 yeah. cabinets. So. And this, this is the primary cabinet you use when you do your, your, your profiles, right? I use this well, about a the third speaker. Of, I'm I mean, sorry. Speaker, yes. Speaker, I like that classic lead 80 just because it sounds, it keeps a lot of clarity when you're doing the clean sounds because mm -hmm. it's got such a high headroom yeah. before it starts breaking up. Um, and I like that because I like my clean sounds to be clean, but I always land in that slightly dirty thing. But the, the 212 also has a classic lead 80 and it also has the diagonal baffle board. So it's, it's in a kind of a trapezoidal chamber. Mm -hmm. um, I've been using the Gytron, which is not chamber. I mean, it doesn't have any of that. It's just a closed back 212. I got that back recently. So I've been using that because it's got a bit of 30 and I get to play with the different speakers. I'm borrowing these two Marshalls from a buddy. Um, one's got eight, you know, 30 watts and one's got 25 watt greenbacks. They're both older Marshall cabinets. Got my 5150 over there. I've got my slew of mics on the top that I'll switch back and forth. I've got the fat heads. I just got this Royer 101. That was what I was showing you earlier. Yeah, that was, yeah, I remember you saying something about that last week. I, I had borrowed a, a Paul Nims that let me profile his driftwood. He sent me a 121 and I liked it enough to, I was going to get a 121 and I saw these and the reason I quit using 121 is because they have super thin ribbons, like 2.5 microns, which is really thin. Yeah. And guitar amps, the way I run them here, are so loud. I was stretching <laughs> the ribbons out. Really? Uh, you play loud? No, I don't play loud on stage. I just play loud here. Um, <laughs> but I was stretching the ribbons out to me as they sounded. The way I blend them, it's probably 57 here and Fathead or ribbon mic somewhere in here. So okay. it's not even. Sometimes it gets more even because that's the, one of the things that I play with per amp. If it's a really bright sounding amp, I'll push a little bit more of the ribbon mic up. Or if it's a little dark sounding amp, I'll bring it way down and use more of the 57. And so the meat, the meat and potatoes is the, the ribbon mic. To me, I, mean, that's, I mean the 57. 57 is my meat and potatoes. This, yeah. I think that's just the sound that people hear. They've heard it on records for so many years. Yeah. And and I've tried condensers, and I've tried a 906, I've tried 421s, I've tried a um, bunch of different things on it. I even tried the PR30 on the Driftwood, which I liked a lot. I may get one of those, but um, to me, the 57 is what everybody hears and thinks that's okay, cool. We have a question from Sean. Um, how do you monitor during profiling? In a separate room, what mic press? I'm in, a, I'm in the same room usually. I've done it in separate rooms. I've done it different ways. Uh, lately, I've been in the same room, but I'm using Sure, I mean, excuse me, Ultimate Ears UE7's ear monitors. So it closes off so much that I'm, I'm kind of 
Mm -hmm. I'm closed off. I might as yeah. well be in another room. Isolation. Yeah. yeah. But they, I've tried headphones of many different brands. I've tried using studio monitor. I've tried all these things. To me, the, the UE7s, they're like my reference monitors. I know yeah. what they should sound like. I know what, you know, there's people that can mix a record on NS10s. You know, know. They, they're not flat, but yeah. they know what frequencies they're hearing yeah. and they're supposed yeah. to be hearing. How much refining do you do before saving the profiles? Chris knows that intimately because he watched me profile. I do. He always complains that I play the same licks over and over. And hey, Dane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too loud. Um, I tend to just, how much, what, about 30 seconds or a minute of you, refining? You, you have it down to such a science. I don't, I'm not even sure you're looking where your fingers are pressing, but you yeah. hit the same things every time and do it within seconds. Well, it doesn't take me long. I mean, I literally just... <laughs> Something like similar to that. And personally, to me, I think a, a big part of that is the fact that, as you just saw, he used dynamics. He went hard, 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 light, and then brought it back in. And in, in the refining process, it, it, it makes it sound like a real lamp. It, well, to me, it does, because it does capture more dynamics if you refine it with more dynamics. And mm -hmm. if you're going to play, it also depends on what kind of music you're playing. If you're playing heavy music, I would do a lot of palm muting. Because it's basically comparing what it thinks it should sound like to what the amp is actually sounding like. So the more you can give it a better comparison, but it yeah. shouldn't take more than a minute to refine. Yeah. yeah. What was the question earlier about live or how do I tweak them for live or something? Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, but someone asked about, um, do you change, do you do any tweaking between your live settings or your live profiles and your studio profiles? Yes, to me the studio is all about what fits in a track and I don't have to worry about, um, well, it's just different. It's like whatever fits in the track. There's like no rules. Everything's out the window. I could play the wackiest, weirdest sound on here. Mm -hmm. It sounds perfect in a track or it can be super thin on here that I would never use live. But it would work perfect in the track. track. Perfect. Yeah. So, but typically, yeah, my, my profiles are more, more geared towards live because we, I play in a band that doesn't have a rhythm guitar player most of the time. Mm -hmm. So I've, it's just guitar, bass, and drums sometimes. So I've got to have a big fat sound that's in. Plus I've got this thing that's been going on in the back of my head since I was younger playing live I've gone out front and listened to my guitar sound it sounds like a mosquito so I'm just I'm ultra sensitive to not sounding thin out front right so I tend to make my live profiles just fat rich in the mids and and yeah. just big sounding so when I play a single note it sounds big yeah. um, sometimes the chords can get muddy but that's when you just have kind of separate rhythm track you know, rhythm profiles and then lead right. profiles yeah I mean and I use the same profiles well I use your profiles live myself and when you know, the gigs I'm playing are not nearly as high profile, and 90% of them are not even in the PA. So I'm going through a similar system, the power station into a Boogie 112 cabinet, and I'm able to pull off with no EQ change a good fat sound, and um, I, I'm pretty happy with it myself. Analog mixer to blend the mic signals. Yes. Yes. And okay. I've used different mixers over the years, I mean, or over the last year, year and a half, two years. When I first started, I mean, I was literally feeling my way through and learning how to do it. I used a little 12-channel Mackie mixer. And honestly, I can go back to some of these profiles I did with a Mackie mixer and okay, Frank, some of the best. Frank just asked, why do you use a valve a valve amp to push out, I'm paraphrasing here because you yep. disappeared, a valve amp to push out a solid state, so to speak, signal? That is a good question. And I've tried solid state amps and they sound fine. They sound better, but they don't. It's just, there's something about the way a tube amp pushes out speakers that yeah. um, it feels more like, it's more of a feel thing. It feels more yeah. like I'm playing a real amp. Even though it doesn't sound as good, it feels more like a real amp. And um, It's not linear. And guys, linear. If, if I don't get your question, I'm not ignoring you. They only last for a few seconds up on the screen, so please put them back up there and I, I promise we'll answer them. Um, so there you go. Any more questions? Um, so, lots of people joining. We've got 21 folks or so up over here. Awesome. Um, so, Rob Thank asked, you, um, quick question for the show today. Which audio interface works best with the Kemper? Mm -hmm. Recording to a MacBook Pro using SPD, if using a PT-12. I've, I've heard about you through the Pete Thorne sites. Your tones are great, by the way. Looking forward to your first podcast. Thank you, Rob. Gotcha. I would not be the guy to ask for that. I. I I've got these uh, recording buddies that just 
look down their nose at me when I say I use a, I use a propeller head balance. I mean, it's a cheap interface. Um, but I mean, the stuff I record at home goes on records, our records, so yeah, the last two records, so. Yeah, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't be have good. to be expensive. And, and it's, that's a testament to this thing because it, it makes it sound so good. I, by the time I send it to my engineer, he would, our mm -hmm. engineer the record, he never knows. You know, I just draw box some of the files and he, he says they work great. So um, I, I don't even use spit if I just go analog out into my interface and into Pro Tools 10. So um, I'm not even up to date on Pro Tools 10 because I'm still running Lion. Um, so yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm. I'm a little bit of a luddite when it comes to. Sorry, there was a brief interruption. <laughs> um, um, flying heel hook. Oh yeah. Asked um, about uh, mic choice and placement being the key. I think we touched on that earlier. Um, it's all. I mean, there's no right and wrong. I mean, there's people that will tell me how what I do is just crazy and wrong. But I mean, this is just what sounds good to me. So figure out what sounds good to you. So AC Roberts, who I know is on here, hold on, somebody, uh, Jer Evils, do you record guitar tracks to check mic placement or are you just comfy enough with your profiles? I think it disappeared before I can say, I'm sorry, Evil. <laughs> it disappeared. I do not record tracks to check them. I just, um, I, I will go back and compare them to things that I know that I think are, are good. There you go. So, um, and, there, there have been, I mean, and I'm not perfect, and I don't ever claim to be perfect, I don't claim that mine are the best or anything. So I just know that sometimes I'll do a whole slew of profiles and I'll go back and listen to too dark or, or too bright or whatever. So I try just to kind of compare them to some things that I know that work all So what you're saying is that sometimes you do have to tweak it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, no, I mean, I've, I'm not perfect. And, and that's the beauty of having all these little knobby things on the front, you can tweak them and honestly, most of my profiles, by the time I end up selling, the ones I sell, I mean, I don't ever tweak them more than this, unless I'm going for something really drastic. I mean, and just one you or can't two see, lights. It's, it's like, literally, it's going point 0.1 to point 0.9. Yeah, it's I not mean, a big deal. And that's just where I like it. And that's not to say that somebody else doesn't like it super bright. And right. To me, it's super bright, but to them, it's not. I mean, you know, my ears are just... And it's going to be according different. to what your music environment is, what songs you're playing, what guitar you're playing. And you know, even for me, I'm playing in a couple of little bar bands, and we do everything from, you know, Heart to Zeppelin to, you know, Journey. Hootie and the Blowfish and Journey, yeah, yeah. Journey. But um, most of my stuff, most of my changes come from using this on the power station. I never adjust the the camper yeah, myself. Where do you run these usually live? Because I haven't used this live yet. Live, for... live. Well, this. About half is normal for me. I'll run the presence right about here. The depth, I usually end up going lower. Okay. Um, the band, I'm, I'm, one of the bands I'm playing with has two guitar players, so I don't want to you know, get into his sonic space. Yeah. He's a little darker than me. Um, and Randy, I love you, buddy, I love you. <laughs> but uh, not like he's darker in a bad way. Anyway, but um, so um, what else do we have here? Uh, so somebody asked, um, also, what changes you've made to profiles when playing single coil versus humbucker? That usually starts with the definition control. And uh, and sometimes, I mean, to me, when I see Strat players, they pretty much, they don't change guitars. They stay on Strat almost mm -hmm. all night because Strats are inherently thin and you have to, and it's fine to have that. And it's a great sound when you can dial it in. Um, but if you're going back and forth, they sound just almost anemic when you're comparing them to a Les Paul. Yeah. So you really kind of have to just make rigs that sound good with them. And I was I was goofing around earlier with my Strat, and I found a couple rigs that just sound. It was actually your Serietone head that we profiled. It yeah. Great on Strat. Mm -hmm. it sounded really dark with any of my other guitars, but Strat mm -hmm. it fit. So I think it's just a matter of finding ones that sound maybe when you're going through and you're if you're on a Les Paul, if you think that's dark, just kind of make a mental note and think. And try my strat through it because that might be just perfect. And what I've done a lot of times is I've cre created rigs, you know, little five slot rigs solely for a particular guitar. Yeah. So I know I have one for strat, I have one for 335, one for Les Paul, and they're kind of generic, but I know that every time I hit that, my single coil strat will sound perfect with that. Right. You know, and it won't sound dark or, or bright or whatever. And that's the, that's the trick. I mean, I've I'm, this is not, I mean, it's still an art. It's not a science yet. You know, I'm still 
one day I'll make great profiles, the next day mm -hmm. I'm not happy with them. So I'll, and a lot of it's your ears too. I mean, some mm -hmm. days I'll come in here and my ears are fresh and I'll do great or not. Mm -hmm. And then I've done great profiles with my ears are totally fried and mm -hmm. I don't know how it happened, but it's, it's, there's no right or wrong. So Dane asks, have you ever been in a Turkish prison? <laughs> no. No. Um, do you like movies about gladiators? Are these seriously the questions? <laughs> hey, it is live. <laughs> um, Are there more than one? Is there more than one movie about a gladiator? Um, Spartacus and my gladiator, maybe two. Right. Spartacus. Um, so, okay, guys, hold on. Have you ever seen a grown man naked? Really? Is that seriously the question? Here we are. We are in. Air, <laughs> we are in airplane right now. Next amps. What are the next amps you plan to profile? I just profiled a Dr. Z Z wreck this week, and man, I've already given it back, but uh, man, it sounds good. So I'll probably put that a mini pack of that. I've still got a bunch of odds and ends, but they're not enough to do mini packs of. So I will um, probably wait until I get some more and maybe do another bundle. So um, the scuttlebutt is that is that still a phrase that works? Scuttlebutt on the internet um, is is kind of going between your 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 packs and yeah. your mini packs. And some folks are really kind of liking this mini pack thing. You think you're going to continue that? If I can find an amp that can justify having 30 profiles of it, that's the biggest thing to me. Is the thing I liked about doing the bundles is you get 10 or 15 amps of, that, and some of them you may not have ever heard of. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's it's almost like a box of chocolates. You know, you get stuff and you think I've never heard of that. I would never try that. Oh shoot! Whoever sent that last one, send it back. Um. It disappeared before I could read it. It should stay on there. It should be it like doesn't. a list. It should. We should reprogram this. Yeah. Um, Dan, so, this is your question again. So, what was I saying? I a box of chocolates. box of chocolates. So, that was what I like about the bundle. Cause, and I could put three or four profiles of an amp that maybe those are just my favorite ones. Mm -hmm. um, but some amps, like the Jim Kelly, the Gytron, you know, I just there's no way I could cover what that amp does in three or four profiles. So, right. Uh, I think some amps just lend themselves to mini packs, and I'll keep doing those when I can. And yeah, I mean, some are not just one trick ponies. Some no, and to me, the out. yeah, I mean, that '69 Marshall. I mean, it's kind of a one trick pony, but I wanted to capture it with all these different uh, speaker cabinets. Mm -hmm. so, uh, um, actually, we were talking earlier today, and this Princeton is an old profile. Are there any profiles you use on on Rage? I'm assuming a stage as well as studio without much tweaking. Oh yeah, I mean uh, a lot of the third power ones. I still use the third power, some of my early third power ones on stage, and I don't want to say there's not a lot of tweaking, but there's hardly any of this tweaking. Uh, yeah. When I use it on stage, I'll add delay times to match the tempo of the song. I'll some days I'll have the compressor on, some days I won't, but typically, I mean, I seldom boost more than a, a light or two. Yeah. And so, like, my, uh, we have a song called What About Now, that that's kind of my bass sound. And so it was such a good profile that even to this day, I've, with all the hundreds of amps I've, or, you know, 100 profiles I've done since then, I still go back to that profile and love it. So I'll start with, I'll dial the What About Now setting, change the delay times, and resave it as a new song. Mm -hmm. And just tweak the gain up or down a little bit and tweak the EQ tiny bits. But I don't do a ton of, if I have to do a ton of tweaking, I'll look for another profile. Yeah, your third power stuff, I found that it's been my go-to clean sound, the third power blackface. Yeah, which um, is that amp. Has worked with every, oh, do you use profiles in the studio through a power amp and mic'd? No, just mic'd. I mean, just, just through the just back, direct, direct out. Yeah. Direct out for everything. Yeah, so. to me, that's the whole point. Of, that's the beauty of the Kemper is it takes out all those variables. I don't think I'd ever want to mic yeah. my cabinet again. You're just introducing possible problems. Right. What is the, what is the exit? X I T S from Pack One. Huh? Uh, my buddy Chris Van Tassel had. A, there's, it's a small company called Exits, and oh. he had two of these amps, and he let me profile them. He was nice enough to let me profile them. They're very super overbuilt. Uh, I mean, they're like aluminum chassis. I mean, they're they're, they're amazing, amazingly built, but they have a very unique tone. And uh, I like that one X15 for the that Led Zeppelin thing I did on the the audio clip. Can we hear that? Uh, no, because I have to dad get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just to find it. I may go. have even deleted it off of here because it was one of those things. I'm, That's I, one of the problems about the Kemper is that there's I only a thousand spots. And I, I do. I run out of room. Isn't it crazy how a guitar player needs more than a thousand places to save a yeah, sound? I, I've deleted it off here. I, I mean, Jeff, my buddy Jeff would go, really, you need more than, than three <laughs> sounds? Can't you play? 
thousands, no. thousands is not I'm, enough. I'm a hoarder. I get it. Thousands not enough. I, I think it should be like at least ten thousand. But I have used that like out of my new mini packs. I've I just used that um, 56 Pro on some sounds live. Man, that, that thing, thing Saul's good. amp was amazing. It did. Saul's had some. Oh, the 56. That was a uh, Shane. Shane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were two. He had a twin and a Pro. Yeah. And that that Pro was just awesome. I even used it on a demo. Dean, our keyboard player, called me at the last minute and said, Hey, I want to. Can you put some guitar on this? So I had like from seven o'clock at night till the next morning to do guitar stuff. So I did three tracks and one of them was the Sounds Pro. <laughs> It That's sounds weird coming through here because it's kind of quiet. We're trying not to overload the phone, but right. man, it sounded so good in the track. It, it, that everything off that Pro, that 56 Pro, is amazing to me. And so here's here's my EQ on my Pro, the the profile that I started with. And then when I saved the song, there's actually no more. I didn't even have to EQ mm -hmm. it at all for recording. Yeah. So, because I'll just scroll through until I find it. If I feel like I have to EQ too much, I'm just I'll just find another profile because I've got plenty. Yeah, you have a few. Maybe, <laughs> maybe one or two. I don't know. I'm just I'm so thankful that you guys like what I do because I'm a nerd about it and I, you know, obsess about it and that's all I think about. You know, my wife gets so tired of me because I'm, you know, thinking about what I am our profile next, you know, but um, this is what I enjoy and, and I like making sounds and I like, you know, making sounds that uh, hopefully other people will like and I'm just very thankful that you guys will like my stuff. Yeah. So guys, um, any, any other questions before we uh, wrap this up? Anything? 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 Yeah, you, you got everything from there. I did have uh, I can't remember his name now, but I, I got an email asking. He, he's having trouble getting a live sound because the clean sound good, but the, some of the distortion sounds are too bright. So I would first say turn the definition down mm -hmm. and just look for other profiles that are just if they sound muddy and dark to you. Uh, definition at home maybe crank the definition but also maybe just crank them up sometime because uh i listened to some of the profiles that i use live oh shoot whoever just sent that last one send it one more time it disappeared too quick i couldn't read it um sometimes they'll sound muddy or not so good on here but then you'll crank it up are you using the kemper remote live performance mode i do uh i was using a ground control pedal but that was in browser mode and then as soon as i got the the remote pedal i had to start using performance mode because it's the only thing that makes sense I think with the remote pedal, the performance mode does. Gotcha. Yeah. Anything else, guys? Anything else? I just totally appreciate you guys tuning in, and I'll be doing more of these as long as Chris can help me. What and, uh, pack is the 56 Pro in? <coughs> it is in the Tweety Pack, the brand new mini pack. And great profiles, keep bringing them. Oh, sorry, my phone's ringing. I'm gonna make it stop. <laughs> sorry. It's live. Sorry. Hey, it's Mike. Live. I have all your profile packs. I've got rid of everything else. Thanks, man. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your contribution to the KPA community, Jed Evil. Jerry Evil. Yeah. Sorry. You're very um, welcome. Thanks for, and you know, letting me be a part of it. And I appreciate, I, when I started putting these out a year ago, and it's been exactly one year this week, so, um, I, you know, I've had buddies that say, man, you should sell your profiles. This is like a year ago, mm -hmm. year and a half ago, and see, your profiles are better than anything I can get anywhere. So I thought, well. I'll try it and see. So when I put it out, I honestly didn't have any expectations. Um, so I just appreciate all you guys, you know, getting behind me and supporting me and buying my profiles. And I'll just keep trying to make cool stuff for you. Cool. And I want to say thanks to Chris Reynolds, CRGTR, uh, for uh, helping me with this. He's He's been kind enough to help me locate a bunch of cool amps. So uh, he's got friends and low places. And, I do. And they have lots of cool amps. So <laughs> I get... Uh, Hey, Brian. I get the benefit of uh, his friends, too. So, um, And thanks to everybody that's let me profile their amps. And thanks to Paul for his driftwood. And Sean says thank you for doing this. Oh, no problem. And hopefully we'll do more. If you want to hear more, just uh, or if you want hey, to, Dave. if you want me to do another one, message me on the uh, website, Mike at inbrickprofiles.com or uh, on the Kepper forum. You know how to find me there. So that's it. Okay. Thanks, guys. Hey, we're out. <laughs>